Um, it's amazing to be here. I just, what, the way that you describe the Studio for Creative Inquiry makes me feel very much at home. Um, as Nika explained, I am an artist and a designer, and I'm squarely in the intersection of uh, art and technology. And, um, you know, I started out as a mechanical engineer, but didn't know that uh, there was a field called product design, industrial design, and was really craving more a creative approach to making products. And so um, in graduate school, you know, I wound up going to graduate school and there discovering that my real passion was around physical things that had a digital component and gave the object some kind of behavior. And from there, wound up seeking out opportunities. So I worked for a number of years at con design consultancies, uh, briefly at Frog Design in San Francisco and for a long time at Smart Design in New York City where I had also uh, worked on creating an interaction lab that was a little more experimental. This is one of the things that uh, I worked on uh, during the consulting part. So uh, what's really been exciting to me throughout my work has been um, exploring things that I see coming up into the future of design and then sharing that out. So doing things like this talk and also um, occasionally get approached to do some writing projects. And those are, have been really fulfilling just for the chance to have dialogue and to share these ideas with other people who are interested in them. One of my favorite writing projects was a 3D printing book um, that Nika mentioned in my bio. I have a copy of it here, although it was um, it's out of print. But uh, the idea behind this was I've um, frequently looked, this, I started my own studio right after leaving Smart Design and um, have always looked for projects that allowed me to explore in a hands-on way something I was really interested in. So I had worked with 3D printers in a much more formal capacity in design firms and um, in uh, academic institutions, but I was really interested in this moment around 2012 to 2014 when um, I could see that 3D printers were becoming more of a household object and were becoming a bit ubiquitous. So I took some of the research I was doing around how might this ubiquity of 3D printing impact us and created a children's book. Um, it's called Leo the Maker Prince. And the idea behind the book is that everything that, um, first of all, the story uses a robot design um, and uses its anatomy as a way to teach kids about the how 3D printing works. So there's a tail that heats up, there's a tray that he can move around, there's actually a scanner in his eyes, in terms of the story. And then everything that's featured in the book can be downloaded and 3D printed. So it was a really exciting way to just test out this idea. What would it be like as a designer who's used to the entire you know industrial chain of things being um, made and stored and warehoused? What if my design just appeared in Japan and could be downloaded and printed overnight. So that was a really fun project. Um, and then a piece that I did, at one point I had met an editor, editor for the New York Times who was really interested in the way that I was looking at robotics as everyday objects and had invited me to do an op-ed piece. And then through that was able to collaborate with artist Katie Turner to look at um, robotics in terms of everyday objects. So these were just some, like what if we had a lamp that wakes you up in the morning, a smart mirror. So this was from 2014 as well, uh, 2013 or 14. And it's been, um, you know, a lot of this kind of thing was happening in design research labs at places like Carnegie Mellon. And, um, you know, uh, now many years later, m mo most of these ideas are startups and starting to be real objects of one sort or another. But um, at the time, yeah, I was interested in just kind of looking at these ideas. And then uh, I occasionally do opinion pieces for places like Popular Science. Um, and my passion project, which I'll talk about in a little bit more depth later, has been the invitation to create the 4D design program at Cranbrook Academy of Art. It's a two-year program, MFA program, that is all around uh, experiments in tangible interaction. Um, and as was mentioned, the, a lot of what I just told you, I've written about in this book, um, the publisher is Harvard Business Review Press, and it, it was really uh, a look at this uh, last 
the last 10 years or 15 years of my career and how it was leading me to look at taking inspiration from robotics labs and thinking about how the um, principles and research that was happening in those labs could be applied to product design for everyday objects. Um, so I got involved with robots when I was a visiting assistant professor at Georgia Tech and met um, a researcher named Dr. Andrea Tamaz, who was, um, had created a lab called the Socially Intelligent Machines Lab. And what I learned uh, at that time was that there was an entire field of robotics. It was called social robotics. And this um, area of robotics is interested in looking at how we can interact with computing machines in a social way. So just looking at the way that I, uh, instead of putting in button presses or codes, how can I approach a computing machine the way that I just approach you or me. If you were to walk into the room and talk to a person and gesture and look in that person's eyes, what, what aspects of that could we bring to interacting with objects? So the first one that we worked on was so Simon. Um, the Simon social robot, we had, an, and all of these projects involve um, a w wonderful and enormous team. The core team was Dr. Tamaz, a mechanical engineer named Jonathan Holmes, and myself, along with an army of um, software engineers and artificial intelligence researchers that were looking at how we could have this robot, which was kind of, again, an extreme of interface, had a uh, a camera in one of its eyes, it had microphones in its head, it could blink, the irises could move, it could move its neck, it had f articulated fingers, ar these ears. We had looked at animal re an how animals um, communicate and exaggerated the ears and then threw lights in them. We just had every kind of modality we could look at. Originally it actually had eyebrows and lips too, but we took that out. And um, that was our way of studying how a social machine could communicate again in a in a gestural way in, that would accompany sound, but re really heavily relying on gesture. This robot could you know sort objects. You could train it to do different tasks. And um, the next robot I worked on with Andrea was a Kinect camera on a stick. And um, so this was a completely different design approach. Whereas the first one we had designed from the ground up, um, we collaborated with a company that had made the 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 body mechanism, Mecha Robotics, but the, the head was completely from scratch. Um, this one was a Kinect camera with, uh, you know, all kind of off the shelf components that so were placed together. So it was this, this um, real design challenge with this arm that came out from the center of the robot's belly and would move up and down. And, and um, what I really wanted to explore there and what I've explored in a lot of my work is how we can look at materials that we don't normally think of as robotics. So in this one, I was interested in using neoprene as a shell and found a woman, Amy Lynn Stolzfutz, who had done her entire master's thesis on clothing from neoprene. And so um, worked with her to create this design. But then, you know, what wound up happening is uh, the robots we were working on had a lot of different applications. They could be used in cafes, they could be in um, people's homes, with people with disabilities, they could be in lobbies, hotels, etc. But what was uh, emerged is a really valuable place was the hospital setting. And um, so that led Dr. Tamaz along with Vivian Chu, um, to become the founders of a company called Diligent Robotics. And they brought me on board at the very beginning where to, to do the very first sketches, the logo, the identity, the branding, the entire thing. So that's been a project that's been um, ongoing. At this point, I've, um, I'm more in an advisory role as I'm doing other projects, but um, continue to work with Diligent on some very specialized projects. And so what was happening with this opportunity is that um, there was someone interested in investing in the fact that nurses were exhausted and they were quitting in droves. And they were finding themselves wanting to be by a patient's bedside, maybe holding their hand, maybe talking them through something, and instead were running up and down hallways, carrying heavy things, um, getting completely exhausted and literally you know, breaking their backs in a way. And so Diligent Robotics, founded by Andrea and Vivian Chu, 
was an approach to looking at that need. And so it is a robot that can fetch and deliver and can um, be available in the hospital on demand. And what has been uh, particularly valuable is to the company is the research that Andrea and Brivian Vivian and Andrea bring from the world of social robotics. I was very um, careful. I did a tons of design research, many, many, many sketches. I did not want to create something cute or um, unnecessarily doll-like, but it was really emerged from the research that having social interaction would be extremely valuable in the hectic hospital setting. So this robot can gesture, it can let people know, it can say, excuse me, it can recognize that people are too close. Um, you know, so these are the few things that, this is a recent iteration of the robot. We actually have a later one now. Um, it uses AI in order to know where it is, to navigate, to talk with people, to have appropriate um, social gestures. Um, it uses eye expressions. It's got a, a number of different ways of giving feedback. Um, there's a headband that you can see at a distance. There's a screen. The screen's actually moved to the front. And we can look at um, a recent interaction. We're still working on nuances, like where to put the badge indication, for example. Um, but this is a pharmacist uh, that I was able to observe. So two of these robots have been deployed in the hospital. I, I live in de suburban Detroit, but Diligent is located in Austin, Texas. And what's been really exciting, you know, I've seen, I was involved with this robot in many, many ways in terms of its creation, but actually seeing it in the hospital setting has been completely um, eye-opening, mind-bending, satisfying and um, you know watching nurses train other nurses on the robot watching watching people greet the robot um, I uh, was have been able to visit the hospital and so it's St. Joseph's Mercy that's just a couple of miles away and be a fly on the wall and observe uh, the nurses say like, oh, hey, Moxie's here. Hey, Moxie, you know, why don't you give that to Moxie? It's, uh, it's been really um, eye-opening and satisfying, you know, because there was a lot of research around this. This is how you cue it up. And then, you know, lately I've been working on what, you know, we have new learning. So that's what's been really exciting about having this out in the real world. One of the things we observed is that it was less valuable to have um, grippers and more valuable to have something that could really press buttons really well because it needs to be able to navigate the hallways. Um, so uh, it's been gotten amazing press, uh, really wonderful support, um, continued investment, and uh, it's been really satisfying. So there's like this little guy, uh, one, one of our recent visits to the hospital to just watch Moxie. So Moxie's an ex extreme example of social intelligence. And like I said earlier, my interest is really how do we learn from some of those nuances? How do we learn from the head nod when we're designing, let's say, a microphone so that it kind of follows me or knows or moves out of the way when I tell it to mute itself? How do we, you know, do we have a, a light that can change? Do we, um, all sorts of interactions. And so that's really what I wrote about in my robot gets me. So um, it's a particularly interesting moment in time as well because as a product designer, I've experienced us looking at um, products in more of a um, canned programmed way. So if I was working on a microwave oven, it might beep three times to let you know, and that would that would be its equivalent message of your popcorn's done. And um, those would already be kind of defined in advance. But now we're seeing this moment where we can through you know um, large language models and AI and the ways that um, we can start to craft products. Uh, they can be um, completely defined in terms of what their behavior, what their um, personality might be, but then uh, we might be able to let them develop in a way that they're more like an entity as opposed to a container of canned responses. And I think that's an interesting moment. It's a moment to um, uh, reflect and observe. It's a moment to be cautious, um, but it's, um, it's happening. So, um, you know, what I wanted to bring to the book was, again, so much of what I had learned through the world of robotics and looking at um, 
expression, you know, and how do objects express themselves? And, um, and think about that as one ring. So this is the My Robot Gets Me framework. Uh, so what I started thinking about was the fact that the specialty that I had developed around designing smart objects depended on so many different ways of designing. Um, as a product designer, we certainly think about form, um, but then there's also things like the sound and the typography and the behavior and the context. And so I created this framework that starts with pres what I call presence at the core, um, but then builds on that and um, have been encouraging designers to use something like this or this as a way for teams to stay aligned. So this can communicate with a number of different people on a team. So there's um, a lot of interviews in the book. I interviewed the um, director of design for Nest Outdoor Security Camera. So there's, there's lots of case studies. Uh, but then I, I just wanted to talk about how some examples from my own work are demonstrating some of the principles. So the core part of that framework is presence. And what I was looking at there was the importance of the physical form and how physical form communicates. Even though we can have electronics be miniaturized, what is it about having a physical thing, having a kiosk in um, an airport that that lets you know that there's some presence, that there's some help there? So this is a project. Um, I was approached by Conrad Meissner, who is a professional drummer. And he told this great story where he said, you know, um, I'm the drummer, I set the beat for the whole band. I'm on stage and the whole band looks at me and the audience looks at me. And what happens is I need to use a metronome and everything out on the market makes me suddenly do this. Can we design a metronome for drummers? So what came out of that was the click brick, which um, we wound up patenting, and now it's being um, produced and distributed there, and Conrad's going to drummers and musicians festivals and various venues to um, share this product. But every interaction is designed with the drummer in mind. So it can screw up, it can screw into the drum kit. You can start the metronome by striking it. You can um, set the tempo by tapping it with the drumstick, or you can also um, roll the drumstick on the knob, but, and then you can stop it. So that's been, you know, and he's been really loving using it. Um, drummers come up to him and say, what is that thing? So that's been really satisfying. Um, expression's the next ring in that. So once you have a physical form that makes sense, how does that form communicate through sound, light, and movement? So one of the projects that I've really enjoyed at Smart Design was leading the interaction efforts for the Neato floor cleaning robot. And part of doing that, we had to, there were a few different interfaces that we were working on. Um, we were working on typography, um, various prototypes, thinking about how this object can communicate at a distance. And I realized how important sound would be and collaborated with a composer named Scooby Leposky. And so the way that I wound up working on this was creating an English text of what the different key moments might be, and then working with Scooby to have him translate them into robot music, essentially. So um, I'm gonna play you a few of these sounds. The first one is how the robot lets you know it's going off to work. So this is like cleaning begun. And then this, the way that the needle works, it can actually recognize changes in its environment. So we work, I work with the engineer to guess that we might be able to recognize a person in front of it. And then it would say, oh, hello. And um, then we have some short sounds for alerts if it's stuck under the couch. Um, and then some signature sounds, waking up and goodbye. Um, the next thing in the ring is interaction. And once an object can express itself, and this is the LEQ, which I also have an interview with the um, CEO. There's a lot about this product that's really interesting in terms of um, social dynamics, interaction, needs of people with cognitive disabilities, et cetera. Um, but I use interaction in this ring because once we have expression, then in order to really n have a conversation with the object, we need that object to sense something about ourselves or about the environment. And so this, I'm gonna get back to a project that um, once in a while I get really 
really obsessed with a particular sensor. Like last summer, there was this wind sensor. A few years ago, like 10 years ago, I was um, doing a residency at School of Visual Arts um, Visible Futures Lab and uh, met there, um, Emily Baltz, who was working, uh, who designed for the senses, was really focusing on food. I was putting sensors into everything. She was putting um, food into different experiments, and we kind of brought our worlds together. And I really wanted to play with capacitive sensing and push the limits of what interface could be. And kind of came to this, like, we don't really have interfaces where we lick. Um, and we and we also kind of discovered that ice cream was one of the few things that you can kind of lick luxuriously in public without it you know, being uh, weird, so, um, or with it being weird. So this was the lick straw that we created. I wound up designing these cups that had coils in them so that the ice cream, when it was placed inside, would become the sensor itself. So here's just a little sample of one of the performances we did with volunteers that were not able to use their hands. iterations of them. The most fun one was at a place called Specials at Sea, which was a grocery store turned gallery in New York City. Um, but that was a fun one. So uh, what the next ring is context. Um, the Hammerhead Bicycle Nav Navigator is a product that uses LED lights instead of having to depend on a screen while you're on a bicycle and you're observing everything in your environment, um, as well as biking. So that's a good case study that I look at in the book. Um, and then from my own studio, I was always interested in, especially in my teaching, um, th tell in encouraging designers to think about context, um, especially now that we can have these little tiny, teeny boards that are internet connected, and those can potentially give you every sort of data feed in the world. You can get your Facebook feed, you can have Twitter messages, or X messages, you can have your stock messages, etc. cetera, but uh, what I wanted to reinforce was the importance of just having just the one piece of data that you need at the moment you need it in the place that you need it. So I created this coat rack um, that is a completely wooden object when it's not um, being used. So it's... Um, CNC'd, so there's a really thin layer, and then there's an LED matrix behind it. When you approach it, it turns on. When it's just sitting there, it's a nice wooden object, quiet thing in the room. You approach it, it turns on, and then it gives you the current temperature as well as the high and the low and the conditions that you're going to have. So what um, I'm really excited about exploring with something like this is not only the materials, uh, alternative materials for electronics, but thinking about that moment about how um, we can think about what you need, how can there be a split second interaction that gives you information and lets you make a decision just as you're going out the door. Um, and then finally, I talk about product ecosystems, so how products work together. So this is from um, the Stanford Center for Design Research and uh, the Mechanical Ottoman, which I talk about in the book, around thinking about social intelligence and all of the interactions that go into that and all of um, the information that we need to make contextually appropriate social decisions. And again, getting back to the diligent project, um, this is something that we continuously think about a lot, is interaction intelligence. And um, I worked with Wendy Ju on a large part of the book, and, and um, we, uh, so there's a lot of um, really exciting stories about Wendy and, and her and her labs. Uh, research and her collaborators at Stanford. Um, so, and then finally I get into product relationships and ethics. Um, but what I'm also very excited about is my current passion project, which is the 4D design department at Cranbrook. And what's um, particularly exciting is 
just the chance to share that. So um, about five and a half years ago, uh, I had been, in addition to my studio practice, uh, I love having one foot in academia, one foot in industry, and had created a number of courses that were around designing smart objects because I had noticed that none of those existed. And what I um, wound up uh, happening is I was approached by Cranbrook, um, by someone who did not know it was my alma mater, to think about creating a uh, entirely new program that would be called 4D Design. And because I had noticed that there was this um, huge need for thinking about how the physical and the digital interact in design, uh, saw this as a perfect fit for Cranbrook, particularly as a place that has such a rich history in design and particularly craft and thinking about physicality and thinking about the importance of materiality and objects and looking at interaction not through software and screens but in this really holistic way, which has become the cornerstone of the 4D design department. So it was founded in 2018. I had a year to set the vision and um, travel and try to spread the word. And then um, welcomed its first cohort in 2019. So in a few weeks, I'm about to graduate the fourth cohort. So we're still quite new. And I'm very interested in spreading the word about us. Um, I think that centers and programs like the, um, the Studio for Creative Inquiry are, are very much needed and um, very much uh, dependent on creative thinking and looking at the future of how objects and and data come together. Um, Cranbrook is a really exciting place to be able to do this. We have a contemporary art museum as well as the Institute of Science. We're a two-year program that's completely studio-based. So um, students work in their studios. Uh, everyone gets, a, a at least right now, a, a 10 foot by 6 foot uh, studio space where they're free to um, explore. They're expected to spend most of their time in the studio. We do have one day that's devoted to very in-depth critiques where we critique um, a, a project, each project for at least an hour at that time. And then we also have a 4D design seminar where we do um, readings in terms of the impact on society and culture. And then there is an academy-wide um, critical studies and writing program. Um, so this is uh, some of, this is a little bit of our campus. Um, this is well, the kind of thing that just, this was from day one. I have them just um, explore tools and play around with um, the ways that physical objects can become dynamic and interactive. And in, in short, people always ask, well, what is 4D design? The, the most succinct way that I describe it is that our craft is form, code, and electronics. So everyone um, at least knows how to look at a 3D modeling and rendering program, send a file to a 3D printer, um, and be able to think and talk about what the meaning of different form semantics are. Um, code. So everyone uh, at least is exposed to code. And my mantra is really that everyone learns how to learn. So we use a lot of open source tools. Um, as well as uh, you know, know how to contribute to community forums, et cetera, and electronics. So we all work with microcontroller platforms such as Arduino and Raspberry Pi. And the form code and electronics manifest in sound, light, and movement. So that's essentially the core of what everyone's doing. And some of the themes that we've been looking at are um, you know, experimental electronics, like a lot of what I talked about with the My Robot Gets Me book, how to, behave, how to program behaviors in light, sound, and motion, um, make for an object that can communicate and be expressive. So this is from Chen Zhu from uh, my very first cohort who graduated in 2021. And he created a exoskeleton that can take movements from the body and then express them outwardly. Um, Ryan Janina was really interested in lighting. He's now living in Paris and um, setting up his own lighting design studio. He was really interested in, first of all, how 3D printed forms can distribute light in different ways. And then he created this for his degree show. My students right now are actually in the middle of setting up for their degree show. So if I'm if you see me on Slack in a, in a minute after the talk, that's why, because I'm keeping up with them. But um, Ryan did this for his degree show in the museum. 
and it was a sound reactive light. So it would, would kind of tell you what the, the pulse of the room was when the room was really full. This is Michael Candy's work. So Michael's also from my very first cohort and had moved to um, suburban Detroit from Australia. And he had already come to me with the, this interest in larger scale robotics and, and a total fascination with fluorescent lights. I would push him, I would say, really? You know, it's like those things are gonna break. He's really, committed to the quality of the fluorescent light. But these are just some of his experiments. You know, the time he was with us, he was finishing up the little sunfish video. So this was um, something that was inspired by a video that he had seen of um, a little robot that went to inspect the um, aftermath of the disaster at um, uh, uh, Fukushima. And he had seen this robot and then worked on reproducing it and turning it into a character in a narrative video. So that you'll see it kind of does this blinking thing. And then um, in his video, it it, um, in his fictional video, it breaks out of the reactor and goes on its own and contaminates things and kind of all chaos breaks loose. There's a scene where an octopus grabs it. So um, this is another piece that he had done and we were working on exhibiting in a show in New York City during the pandemic that got canceled. But um, This is a piece that he did at Cranbrook that's more of a time piece. So um, every second it will actually rotate. You can kind of see in the center there, there's a weight. And as the motor moves, it will make the entire structure move. Um, virtuality and digital presence. So even though I talk about the importance of physicality, I'm really also interested in this back and forth between the physical and the virtual and having students explore that. So um, this is a project that was created by Vikram Kaladindi who graduated in our 22 class. And we had an ongoing dialogue in the studio around um, NFTs had just been exploding at that time and how um, scarcity creates value. And so uh, what he decided to do was create an NFT that he would like to launch and um, he was interested in the fact that he thought he could have 20 pounds to maybe shed. And could he create a contract? And he was working with a lawyer around losing a pound. So this piece is called a pound of flesh. Losing one pound for every one of these that you purchase. So therefore, there's necessarily a limit and there's necessarily scarcity. And it's actually a kind of writhing, throbbing animation that's related to skin structures and cell structures. Um, Jerry Lee, uh, for his degree show in the museum, was interested in having an expression of the mood in the room. So kind of like those, how are you feeling, um, buttons. He translated those into a giant emoji that took up the entire wall that would just kind of you know reflect the mood of the room. So there's Jerry. Um, Vikram, again, had done a piece called A God Forsaken that would scrub a uh, video game chats and take some of the dialogue and then um, autonomously print it out onto this giant scroll. And, um, and then social commentary is something that just runs through everything that we do. We're always trying to talk about what the technology implies, what the future of it might be. Uh, so this is a piece by Meryl Nor Norlander who was interested in exploring uh, gender fluidity. And this was, again, during the pandemic, I really en encouraged and worked with students to find outdoor spaces. So this is our Greek theater on campus. And what Meryl had done was, um, it was it's normally a fountain that's filled with water, but it was empty. And we weren't allowed to gather, I mean, we couldn't gather in, indoor spaces, but we, she was able to create a pool by projecting onto the stones that were in this empty fountain. And then also worked with a singer um, who had sung opera before, Brian Kovach, who was singing an aria from Carmen at the same time that the swimming projection was happening. So that was a really lovely way for us all to be together and enjoy a creative piece, but um, still be safe and social distanced. Um, Michael has another piece that's been ongoing. I've been trying to connect him with folks in Detroit around where he could find a racetrack. He did his first iteration of the selfless um, of the selfless driving car, which is inspired by Lauren Carpenter's 1991 graphical interface experiment um, that where the it's cr a crowdsourced um, pong rackets. And what he was interested in is could he let the crowd um, 
control a car that he intends to be in. So this is a model car, and this is as far as it's gotten so far, but he created the interface where everyone in the audience can decide if the car needs to go left or right, and he would like to do the experiment where he's in the car and the crowd drives him. Um, and then finally, materiality is something that also is woven through everything we do. We're always exploring, experimenting, seeing how we can get data to flow through our material objects in some way. Um, Merrill had created this wearable wearable suit that would change color. Um, Emily Bomarito was working on some soft robotics experiments, which I, I think there's a lot of exploration to do. So these were forms that she had cast in silicone, and when they are connected to an air source, a pneumatic, um, pneumatically, uh, electronically controlled pneumatics, they will actually turn into grippers or, or turn into bulbous forms and change shapes. So, And then Chen Zhuo, for his degree show, had created um, these ferrofluid experiments. This, if you can imagine a canvas where you saw ink, but he had a, a, a motor and a, a magnet behind it, so that as the motor moved the magnet, this ink blot would actually change and morph. Um, and then Cody Norman was one of our electives. He graduated from the 3D design department, not 4D, but he's been creating an entire practice around using industrial robot arms to create experimental furniture pieces. Um, so that's a little bit of what's going on. What's been really exciting also, um, being in suburban Detroit and in the Detroit area, is that there's a new lab that's opened up that is a co-working space specifically for um, technology uh, forward startups. And um, I've been trying to keep tabs on them and making some connections there. And one of the latest things that I've been involved with has been um, doing an art project that will manifest in a year um, in the new lab space. So they've taken over, they've got um, a building that's next door to the old train station. And uh, as mentioned in my bio, I've been really interested in what the future of public transportation might be, thinking about transportation that's autonomous, networked, and shared. And um, you know, essentially, when I moved to take the Cranbrook position, people would say, well, how do you like it? How do you like it here? And, um, you know, and I love Michigan. I love all of the creative startup um, energy that's happening in Detroit and the history of Detroit for sure. But um, as a native New Yorker, it's been really difficult for me to get my head around Detroit as a city um, dependent on private car ownership, which feels very isolating. So I had been working with a publisher um, that I had pitched an idea of doing a a book about this, it was called The Big Handoff, Getting From Here to There with Connected Transportation. And the more I did research and talked to um, experts, and uh, the ideas are out there, the, more, the bigger challenge is getting people to want to give up their cars and maybe, maybe walk 15 minutes and wait 15 minutes, maybe walk a half a mile, um, which is a big ask. So what I did instead of the book, I've pivoted and um, have gotten a grant from the Knight Foundation to do something that's much more public and playful in this space. And I've been um, reading a number of books. If anybody wants to geek out on the books that are around the, the future of autonomous public transportation, I've got a few that I love and I'd love to learn about more. One of the ones that I love is Ghost Road by Anthony M. Townsend and these illustrations that Brian Boyer, who's a friend of mine now in Detroit, worked on and looking at um, you know, how vehicles might come together, how they might be street furniture, how they might platoon and become trains that be, can be software rails that go up and down main thoroughfares. Um, and just thinking about all of those, but wanting to share those with the public to plant the idea that um, we can ask for better systems um, if, we, if we know to push for them. Otherwise, uh, we will be sold private autonomous vehicles that sit in our driveway idle for 90% of the time. So um, the project I'm working on is a collaboration with a longtime friend, Motomichi Nakamura, who um, comes to Cranbrook per periodically. He's one of the folks that I love having 
to do workshops. Um, and he has very much inspired the students so far. And he's done a number. Of, these are some of his projection mapping projects. The one on the left is actually at the Cranbrook Library. So he and I had set up this space. And he came and did a really, really fun installation that brought everyone out on an evening, a cold evening. And you know we just had a blast standing out there. And so, um, oh, this is the latest. This, this is the restroom in the studio at 4D. But I just have started, he and I, um, he just flew out to Detroit to scope out the space. And we've started doing experiments. And we're going to, um, committed to actually doing interactive projection. So this is just, you know, playful. That it's not like super rough. It's not lined up right. And but like we're we're working on these visions of it's a it's a it's broad strokes, broad strokes of of um, whimsy, but getting people to you know turning the entire interior of that ninety thousand square foot building into this kind of little city with these vehicles that pop in and out and drop people off. So um, that's what I've been up to, and it's been amazing to be able to share that with you. And I love being here at the studio for creating inquiry. I, um, it's, it's super exciting what you all are up to. So thank you. Oh yes, so the question is, let me see if I get this right. The question is, what does an experimental art approach um, allow me as a creator to do that an um, engineering approach would not have? And vice versa. So, um, you know, going to Cranbrook was really pivotal in my career, just in terms of thinking about the why, I guess, over the how. So I think in everything that I'd um, seen as opportunities as an engineer, um, and it's not that engineers only think about that, but it's how people think of engineers. People hire engineers to um, figure out the how, but don't necessarily always involve them in the why. And I think that the artist's approach is really just completely immersed in the why, and um, which allows allows you to work on a project and then and then continually pivot and. Um, which is good and bad, right? So I think that then the engineer, the en having a background in engineering allows me to say, okay, wait a second, let's make sure the scope of this is not getting out of control or out of hand. And what's been really exciting is that there have been students like Michael Candy and Steve Kuypers, whose work I, I didn't get a chance to show, who've been coming to me from art backgrounds, but are some of the most talented engineers I've ever met, even though they weren't trained as engineers. So this is a really interesting, I think, time in history where people are able to um, be a little more self-taught, um, you know, find again this idea of learning how to learn, uh, but you know, it's something that uh, I have to constantly think about with students: is how do I, how do I, how do I tell them? Because one of the things that uh, I've found in all of my teaching in design is that I ha I do have to continually say you are not an engineer. This is not an engineering project because everyone is tempted. Like if I were making this interactive microphone, you're tempted to want to make it perfect and want to engineer it when the value is prototyping the interaction and getting to test that and then the engineer can follow that but but their time is not really well spent in trying to engineer something that may pivot in terms of its idea so i don't know if that answers but that's a little bit paul does it work now thanks wonderful to hear it all carla yeah. i had a question early on you said moxie was an extreme example of social something oh right of social intelligence why is it extreme Oh, well, you know, it's more like the Simon, the first project, but the it's um, what's extreme about it is, uh, I guess what I'm getting at with that statement is that we can take parts of what Moxie does. So M Moxie um, can navigate the environment. Moxie can um, nod its head and... 
Um, Moxie can have shared gaze, and, and not every product needs to do that. This interactive microphone doesn't necessarily need to do that. It may just need to nod, or it may just need to um, understand my hand gesture. So what I was getting at with that is that um, we think about, like, we need to almost deprogram ourselves because we have this word robot and robotics in our heads and and we think of something like moxie because that's what's culturally ingrained to us from sci-fi imagery where you know we think about oh it's got to be moving around and it's got to be interacting with people and and really what I'm what I'm interested in in the book is just small slices of that thank you Hi, um, so I'm a mechanical engineering and art student at CMU, um, doing my undergrad here. Uh, but um, so I was, I was really curious about, like, especially in regards to uh, robots like Moxie. I, I, I kind of struggle a lot of the time, I think, with trying to reconcile both, like, the context of objects that I make in in space, especially in my like engineering curriculum, because I'm also art trained, and I also kind of have this like, I think like I don't know, I, I'm kind of rambling, but um, I guess like a wider understanding of like how objects can like impact us in our lives, even if it's like. And I don't know, um, but anyways, I was just wondering like what kind of decision, what does the decision making process look like when it comes to technology like Moxie where like you, you know, like you specifically said that you don't want like Moxie to replace people's jobs, but what kind of like decisions did you maybe make to ensure that that wouldn't be the case, for instance? Okay. so. Um, that's so. For, that's a really interesting question, and I have a lot of questions for you about mechanical engineering and art, as how how they come together for you here. Um, but you know, there's really no way to necessarily ensure what yeah. our objects will do in the future, which is part of why I've. I really value being at a place like Cranbrook where critical thinking and um, critical dialogue is is front and center and, and part of the sort of fabric of the larger culture. Um, you know, essentially though, it comes down to design research. So, um, and you know, again, to be clear, a, a project like Moxie, um, even though I was head of design at the start, it involves an entire team of really fabulous people. Like I, I really adore the engineers that I work with and the um, software folks. And I mean, there's a great team of people there. And um, Andrea and Vivian, you know, I mean, are the the co-founders and are you know constantly thinking about all of those things. But you know, you they've the company's founded on this principle of helping nurses, not replacing nurses. And so there are core principles when a, a company is, is founded. And, um, and there's a lot that has to do with design research, actually going into hospitals, talking to people, understanding what their needs are. And, uh, you know, and, and I mean, particularly like this question comes up quite a bit in a lot of the talks that I do. And I think it's a it's a really important question around thinking about jobs. I mean, I have a pretty utopian view of this in the sense that I really think that um, jobs are about a distribution of resources and not about technology. It's kind of it's a capitalism problem. It's not a technology problem. That said, that's a very utopian. There's a lot that has to happen, and you've got to get buy-in from everyone up and down the chain in order for that really to happen. But when I think about things, like you know, because I've been talking about autonomous vehicles so much lately, um, this question comes up a lot. And what uh, you know, I really feel strongly is that there could be a lot of opportunity for new jobs. You know, people have to be willing to be um, retrained or um, alternatively trained, and uh, people who start companies have to value um, 
human interaction, but there's so much value in, in human interaction. I mean, for example, if I think about autonomous vehicles and I think about my son's school bus, and that bus driver would be um, much better served to everyone in the picture if he were not driving the bus. You know, if he were there actually managing people. And on a lot of the visions that we look at around autonomous vehicles, even delivery vehicles to involve, and I talk about this in the, in the last chapter of the book. I really, I got, I, I had kind of a, da a dark moment when I started thinking about, because the, the book actually, I finished it in the height of the pandemic. I like, locked myself in a room and set a timer every day. And, like, and, um, and at that time, there was all this news about like, you know, and, and certainly Moxie was getting attention because Moxie could, you know, collect samples and, you know, and there were all these robots that could just like disinfect things and nobody ever had to see another person again, you know, and it really made me sort of sad and, and upset about like, oh, okay, so finally everyone's talking about the robots and this is what you're talking about. But, um, you know, so I, I do think that, that, just having critical dialogue and thinking about it. And I, I do think that folks who are um, company founders like Vivian and Andrea are, you know, it, have uh, hard decisions to make sometimes. Um, can you speak more about your, pro your design research process, especially since you're de designing things from robots like Moxie, but also autonomous vehicles? Yes, sure. Um, so, uh, uh, so to be clear, I'm actually not designing an autonomous vehicle, I'm designing a super whimsical playground of an illustration of a blurry future of autonomous vehicles. So, um, and that's got its own its own process. I'm a big believer in deep process. Uh, for the Moxie project, which I talk about a bit in the book, um, there, you know, there. I think there are a lot of traditional design methods that are are uh, definitely valuable. Design research, absolutely. Um, talking to real people, spending real time with them. Um, qualitative research that involves deep conversations, um, shadowing spending time in real situations, real homes or the real hospital setting, et cetera. And then I think there are a lot of interaction design methods that we don't necessarily think about. I mean, I was trained as an industrial design product designer and we think about renderings. I would render this chair in this like, beautiful glossy image. And the thing about 4D design or the kind of design that I do is that that image doesn't capture what I'm designing because it's dynamic, it's sound, light, and movement in some way, shape, or form. And so in order to capture that, there um, are, first, first of all, sketching methods. So one of the methods that I'm a big believer in is storyboarding. And so, you know, actually the way that a, like a filmmaker storyboards, storyboard the interaction of, you know, from the time I see that chair to the time that I, I sit in it, to what happens when I sit in it, to what happens when I leave the room, you know, really like actually set an establishing shot where you don't, you know, you don't even see the thing, close-ups of the nuances of the interaction. So that's one thing, is the storyboarding. Another thing I'm a big believer in is body storming. And this is something that we do, you know, in fact, I think this summer we're gonna do a, a big, um, with, with the folks at Diligent, we're gonna do a, another. We, we constantly will go back when we run into um, an issue with some aspect of the interaction, like, oh, people don't hear the, ro you know, this, with the robots in an elevator, for example. Like we, and, and from the very start, before there was even a robot design, before there was even a sketch of a form, what I had the team do was literally play act almost like you're in kindergarten and have one person play the role of the robot and one person play the role of say the nurse and one place and play, play the role of the pharmacist and try to set up a mock environment as much as possible so with cardboard and shelves and boxes that represent the medications or you know hospital supplies whatever it is and then you know whatever quick and dirty like get a 
a post-it pad, we put it on the robot's head, the robot now is blinking, bl blinking red. And what that does is it really just reveals a lot of the parts of the interaction that you wouldn't necessarily see or think of in that beautiful rendering of the thing as just a static object. So, um, you know, that's just another, I think, and, but like all, you know, the core of all design, I think, is can you, how can you be quick and dirty when, when decisions are being made at the start? And I think that's super valuable. Another question? Carla, I was curious, um, the, many of the projects that you showed, right, so light, sound, movement. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of what drives interaction is, is the code, is sort of the uh, intelligence that people are embedding into that. I'm curious how you help students think about that. And then I'm also curious about what that looks like today, given the sort of rapid change of sort of our abilities to use different types of computational intelligence systems, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, 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 no, that's a great question. It's very, it's, it is, um, this is actually a big challenge because especially with people who are new to code, you don't just suddenly code a gesture of a robot arm, right? That's pretty complex. Um, so, I mean, again, a lot of it goes da back to prototyping and quick and dirty and getting at the essence of the interaction rather than the engineering of the thing. And um, so, you know, any there, I didn't talk about it in the last question, but things like video prototyping, Wizard of Oz prototyping, um, you know, anything, uh, the, certainly the body storming, um, you know, those things I think are, are really valuable. But then in terms of, yeah, the actual code, um, I'm constantly looking for tools. Like there was something that IDEO created recently that was called Marionette that, um, that allows you to use Blender, the 3D modeling tool, the Blender timeline, and and translate that into servo motor motions. Like I'm just yeah, th I mean it's it's a huge it's a huge challenge. Or you know even even something as what it seems like simple as as lighting is really it's really labor intensive to to code. You know so like like we use a number of libraries. Like, yeah, this is a constant battle to be honest, but. Um, you know, there was there's a company that just um, oh, and I forgot what they're called, that ha was ha is um, doing an AI robotics movement and more tools for that. So I see that emerging, and I'm kind of amazed with the students because it's you know we don't have traditional classes like it is studio based, so that is also incredibly challenging. Um, but I've been amazed that I've had stu I had a student I have a student who's new this year first year who um, has never coded before in her life. And I, I went up to her, she had an Arduino all set up, she had an ultrasonic sensor, and, and I said, wow, how'd you do this? And she said, oh, I just went to chat GPT and said, write me Arduino code for making a servo, you know, a, a ultrasonic sensor control the servo motor. And I thought, huh. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot that's emerging, but it's a constant challenge. So I'd love to share any ideas around tools. I mean, it comes back to tool sets, I think. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Could be lukewarm. <laughs> yeah, I am wondering how you are thinking of human interaction with the future of public transportation. And especially, like, uh, I can kind of envision uh, some of the learning from the social robot can be embedded into this system as well. So I want to hear more about your uh, the vision of it. Oh, yeah. There is so much. That's like five other talks right there. And, um, and uh, I, you know, you've got some great researchers here, even folks in your audience right now, um, who are working on, on this. So uh, I do have a, a, some, a friend and sometimes collaborator um, Wendy Ju, who's at Cornell Tech right now, and uh, you know her lab has been working on. There's so much around it, like even just the nuance of um, you cross the street and you make eye contact with the driver. What now happens with an autonomous vehicle when you cross the street? So how does it express to you that it sees you? 
there, yeah, so there, the, I will say there are, um, there's deep research that's happening in this area, and if you wanted to write to me, I'd be happy to point you in that direction. Um, but my project right now is more, is more about the public acceptance of it rather than the, um, the details. But um, you've got great, great faculty here at CMU that I know is working on this as well. So I'd be happy to connect you. Thank you.